from just holding on to it too tight. So the idea here for me was allow it to, to grow and to change while you're working on the painting. And so to have the freedom to do that, you also have to build in a working method that allows you to make changes as you uh, go through the process. As you mature as an artist, I think it allows you more latitude so that you can continue to develop and keep changing things all the way through the whole process and hopefully you make good decisions, making them, making decisions that will impact the painting in a positive way. Well, first of all, welcome to my studio. As you can see, behind me is a painting of a woman who's a dancer, and the title is Salome's Rue. Now, I could have titled it, I guess, uh, Salome's Regret or something else, but I thought it was very fitting that the, the exact meaning of the word was exactly what I was trying to portray in her expression, the way her body is, the way she's standing. And so I did a number of drawings, but the whole process really started with a portrait that I did of her. And I often start off with a new model by doing a portrait of them, simply to get to know them, to find out a little bit more about them. And in this case, Federica uh, was telling me about her life and so on, and said that she was a, a ballet dancer. And so the idea started there that I would do um, a painting of a dancer. I actually had Federica take different poses until it just felt right. And then you refine it from there. You start off with a gesture. Sometimes it's an exaggeration. If it's too explicit, if it's too overdone, then it looks cartoonish and it does, or like an illustration. And so you have to kind of ratchet it back a little bit, uh, refine it so that um, it just barely says what you want it to say without overdoing it. So this is a pretty dramatic pose, a pretty dramatic moment. And so uh, you get liberties with that. It doesn't have to be, you know, wailing and throwing your arms back and you know tearing your hair out but it could be something of real regret and that's exactly what i'm trying to to show here i've been working about two and a half weeks on the painting uh started off with doing a number of drawings for the composition and then drew the whole figure onto the canvas in charcoal and white chalk. I started on a, on a tone ground. Um, you can see the color of the, the ground is over here. It's um, kind of a light beige sand color. I range uh, from a fairly light sandy color imprimatura to a fairly dark gray, um, depending on the subject. An explanation a little bit about the setting of uh, this painting is the, the background is completely imagined. It's based on uh, contrast to the figure so that where I want contrast, I bring it out by next to her arm. This is quite dark here, like a storm cloud. And then next to her head where her hair is dark, I've lightened it because I want to accentuate these areas. The background is, is something I'll probably work on just as much as I do the figure, trying to get the exact right uh, setting for the painting. So a lot of times, instead of painting in a whole area of value and then having to paint it over, it makes a lot more sense for me to, to use chalk or pastel on the painting itself, because if you want to erase it, you simply take a rag, a piece of paper towel with some turpentine on it, and just it comes right off. So, for example, I was looking at the composition thinking that it would be really nice to have a line of clouds going in this direction. So I just take a piece of, this is chalk I make myself, by the way. Um, but just put in a line uh, to give, your, give yourself an idea. And then you just step back and you say, oh, compositionally, that might work, might not work. But then if you want to remove it, you can just take either mineral spirits or water. It doesn't really matter. Anything it comes right off. So it's really helpful for making decisions to be able to see things um, on the painting, but not have to paint them in. So it again, builds in flexibility. My medium in this kind of weather is just linseed oil. Um, it's so warm, everything dries really quickly. In the winter, I use uh, black oil. These are a fairly limited range of, of pigments for this painting. 
um, yellow ochre, vermilion, and I'm using a kind of an earth red, raw umber. And then I have two blacks here. One is um, pure ivory black. The other one is a mixture with some umber in it. Um, this is a mixture of gray, which is black, brown, and white, and then cobalt blue. And I'm using that for the, for the sky. And white lead, of course. So right now I'm been, I've been working on her legs in, this morning and I'm kind of adjusting the sky to go with the value of her legs. And also I've got kind of a black line here that's way too strong and I will be sort of eliminating the line just so that I have, have less contrast there. Occasionally look at the, um, the contours of her leg just to make sure that I'm getting the, the correct line of the outside of her leg. And I first uh, put in a swatch of cloth that was part of her dress that comes down here. And um, I put it in in chalk. I kind of I liked the, the placement of it, the angle. Uh, it kind of kept your eye in this area. And I just painted it in a little bit. And now I will set it up in nature and actually draw it and then paint it all completely uh, resolved. Um, I haven't actually decided how I'm going to have the, the cloth or the dress you know, coming down here. Uh, I'll probably set that up with a mannequin after um, I'm, I'm finished with the model. So, I'll just continue with the background a little bit. I'll probably, at some point, design her hair so that the shapes uh, will fit in this area and then make this transition from hip to, to arm uh, more interesting. So it'll break up the, the background and then also the shape or silhouette of the, of the figure. Uh, stepping back gives you perspective on not only the model but also on, on your painting. Uh, I have a mirror that I, that I look at quite often, it's broken. Um, black mirror on one side, taped to a normal mirror on the other side. And I check drawing with the regular mirror and the values in the black mirror. So I'm able to reduce the amount of, of color and be able to see the, the contrast pretty, pretty accurately. The whole figure was done in monochrome first. And so, and most of what you see here is still really limited in terms of uh, the color that's been added. So the kind of greenish blue notes around her neck, I just put in this morning just to see how they're going to affect all the area around her uh, neck and head. The idea of putting things in with too much chroma is pretty much the way that I've worked uh, since I first started painting and that I would do an exaggeration of it just to see how far I could take the warms and the cools and then adjust them back. Often I think, especially students that are starting out, are really timid to put in a strong chroma, either cool or warm. And to get over that, um, at one point I was instructed to exaggerate or push it to the extreme uh, just to see how much you can get away with. And I think when you look at uh, really technically amazing painters, they're constantly pushing the envelope on the amount of chroma that they can put in a, into a painting. If you just put in the warms, then the, the figure looks like they're sunburned. If you balance it with a, enough cool, then it looks really fleshy. So it's finding that, that critical balance between cool notes and warm notes that make the, the flesh come to life. Everything in the studio is set up for being able to do this. So this 
This window here is the one that is giving light to my canvas. And the window on the other side of the curtain is the window that gives light to the model. So it's uh, small, very small. It's about a quarter the size of this other window. Because to have too much light on the model means that you kind of wash out all the halftones. But if you have the right amount on the model, you can then see exactly all the halftones right up to the highlight. But when you're working on your canvas, you need tons of light to be able to see what you're doing. So dividing this up is something that's you know, taken quite a bit of study and quite a bit of experimentation to, to get around to sort of adjusting. But once uh, you have your studio set up correctly, it makes painting um, just a whole lot easier. The other thing is that the walls are painted uh, a particular color. There are reflectors that keep the light from bouncing off the ceiling right down to the fact that I wear a black shirt. Because if I had a white shirt on the, as I walked up to the, the canvas, it would reflect into the canvas. So you'll never probably ever see me except for a graduation or at a wedding or a funeral wearing a white shirt. I think I have one or two. Everything else in my closet is black. I think what happens with a painting, at least as I develop the work, these subconscious things in my life are pulled up. And those are the ones that I didn't realize that were there. And they become part of the painting. And they affect where the painting goes. So it's constantly evolving, constantly changing. I don't know a lot of times where paintings come from. The idea triggers something, and all the stars kind of line up, and then you just can't kind of go for it. Other times, you think they're all in a line, and you're painting away, and wow, what a mistake. <laughs> so you, you end up scrapping the painting and doing something else. But you know, there, there's no formula for, for producing a, a painting every single time and having it come out. There just isn't. And if you're, you're really intuitive and, and open and listening to yourself and, listen, and looking at the painting and getting feedback from the painting, you become part of the process. The painting becomes part of the process. Everything is moving. Everything has to change. So it's fun. It's exhausting, but it's really fun. <laughs>